And again, good evening on behalf of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission and the Effort of Cloister Associates. Welcome to tonight's Virtual Effort Academy. My name is Elizabeth Berthod and I am the Historic Site Administrator at Effort of Cloister. I acknowledge that my home where I am tonight sits on the ancestral lands of the Lenai Lenape who were displaced and defrauded of their land by early European immigrants. I honor with gratitude the people who stewarded this land, past, present, and future. For those of you who are not familiar with the effort of Cloister, this community was founded in 1732 by a German immigrant named Conrad Beisel. The community consisted of celibate members as well as married members and their family. We recognize that this community was founded on the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock and Lenai Lenape. Tonight's virtual academy is sponsored by the Women's Club of Ephrata and the 1777 Americana Inn Black Forest Brewery. And at this time, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Susan Playstead. I've known Susan for many years now. Uh, worked with her in some foodways at another site as she um, did some uh, cooking demonstrations for me at Chadsford Historical Society. And she is the proprietress of Heart to Hearth Cookery in Bucks County. She does a lot of food waste uh, programs all over Bucks County, uh, a lot at Pensbury Manor, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And with that, I am going to turn the program over to Susan. Wanishi does thank you in Lenape. And Wanishi to everyone who has chosen to join this program tonight. I interpret Lenape Foodways and Lifeways here in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, because it is part of my heritage. I am not Lenape. I am, my home state is Maine. I am Penobscot and Penacook, but to honor my native heritage, I include in my heart to heart cookery, interpreting Lenape. I hope you're all seeing my wonderful, peaceful slide of waterways and the dugout canoes. And I want to just describe to make sure everyone knows what Lenape Hokan was, which is what all the land of Lenape was referred to. And that included all of New Jersey, part of Delaware, um, part of New York, and the eastern part of Pennsylvania. And we're looking at the waterways. All of the villages were on waterways, and the dugout canoe was the method of transportation. We are now moving up to Plymouth Patuxet Museum, the Wampanoag, for this beautiful picture of women that they're actually participating in a dugout canoe race. But this is so apropos to many of the things I will be talking about because women went in the dugout canoe to do harvesting and some of the foraging. As I said, food waste is not just about food. It's about the things that you use to, uh, the utensils that you use to make food as well. So what you're looking at now is the burning method that was used to make and char the wood so that the stone tools would be able to do the work. Yes, this is a dugout canoe because it gives an excellent example, but the majority of my burl bowls and are made, and some of my ladles too, are made with this same exact technique. And I have another slide that shows this more clearly where you can see the blackened area that the stone tools can work well on and the controlled fire that has to be very controlled so it does not obviously burn down too far. And then there's the longhouses. 
there were three clans in all of the Lenape villages and they were made out of saplings that are put in the ground at angles and each one of those intersections where you see them cross another sapling, it is tied with cordage. And cordage is like a rope that's made out of inner twine. And then this long house is just beginning to have the harvested bark cover it. Notice the platform. Uh, you're going to look at an interior of a long house in a moment. And that platform is important to note because you'll be seeing how it's used. Now, what I do in my interpretation of Lenape is I interpret at the cusp of European contact. The Lenape was not a written language. It is an oral language. And my best documentation is Europeans who wrote very, with, with great detail um, about what they saw about life ways. And also it is from archeological evidence and the size of the long houses and where they are located, evidence remains behind so that it is known. Now the three clans of the Lenape, you're either a wolf, a turtle, or a turkey. It is a matrilineal society. And we will say that I am a turtle, which is what I usually interpret myself as. And I would be the elder, I, with life expectancy about 35 to 40 years of age, I would be the elder and held in great regard. And it, I would be the one who would be making decisions as would be the elder of the turkey and the wolf clan. So it's a matrilineal society for those that are living in this long house, they would all be related to through the maternal line. This is a reproduction of an, what an inside of the long house could potentially look like. And now I think you can see that platform I was describing and pointing out, that is where the sleeping is done. The few items that were possessions, were, which weren't that many, are stored above. You cannot see it too well, but there is a small fire at one end. And usually all the infants are around that and think about brain tan hide and hammocks where they're sleeping. That's just to give you an idea about living. And I'll show some other pictures that will help depict it as well. Here is a wiki up. Now this wiki up is unusual because it's actually a doctoral candidates part of his experimental archeology span from which he wrote his thesis. So he's actually interpreting going to the waterways in the spring when the fish are running and making a temporary dwelling. And a temporary dwelling would be made with a mat rather than bark. But yet he wanted to harvest bark. So this is a wiki up made with bark. Um, this they actually lived with in on the island for the entire time of his experimentation. And what isn't correct about this wiki up and what you didn't see on the longhouse is how low the doors are. The, the door entry is much higher than it would have been. And this is a mat that's rolled up that would roll down very frequently, it was a bare skin. To talk about clothing, and yes, this is me, but you can see it was a while ago. This is when I first started interpreting Lenape, and this is my very first brain tan wrap skirt and mantle. 
And I wanted to use this while I talk about clothing, but as I talk about these slides, I am going to point out some other things that are there so that you're aware. I am staying, standing at the main fire in the, in the village. In back of me is the drying rack. The only method of preservation of food was by drying. So as I'm standing there, and I'm holding a cattail, by the way, what I am wearing is a three hide brain tanned wrap skirt and a two hide top. Brain tanning is extremely complex. I have participated at, um, in actually doing it at Moccasin Meat in New York. I have a little piece of what I did, but we're talking about needing to, after the deer are brought into the village and the hide is removed, it immediately has the flesh scraped off. Then it is soaked in water. It has the hair scraped off, and then it is soaked again. It has the membrane on one side, and, and it actually has to be scraped on both sides. And then the brain of one deer is used for the tanning of one hide, and you make a solution, and you actually have it go in that solution, and then rinse it, and then you have it go in that solution three and four times, and then you have to break the hide. After that, you smoke the hide. Without smoking the hide, every the, the brain tanned hide, the result will be that every time it rains, it will get exceedingly stiff. So having explained that, as you look at it, um, it smells of smoke. The fringe is to help wick off water. I often wondered how long, because I had no written documentation of how long these brain tan, brain tan clothing would last, but I can tell you that I am now on my second one. Now you can't have, you need pots for food ways, and I'm going to take you through the firing of pots. Keep in mind, again, I did this at Moccasin Meat, and this is white clay, it's more grayish of New York, where our Pennsylvania clay is naturally red. This was a week's process of making these pots and they had to dry in the sun and then be brought closer and closer to the fire. It was a long process as you look in, at these pictures, you're going to see that darkness is beginning to, to set in. Now a second fire is started and allowed to burn down to embers. Now this is unusual. I hope that you can see the pot kind of in between uh, the green branches and the punky wood. You know, to make a good fire for cooking, this is not how to make it. But when you're firing pots and you don't want the fire to get too hot too fast, and you're hoping that when the fire gets completely spent down to ash, that your pot remains whole, this is how you want to do it. So the fire is burning now. And look very carefully. You should be able to see that pot in underneath the fire. You can't tell anything or do anything until the fire is completely out and we have to wait for all of the embers to cool. Now you can see how difficult it is to see the pots when it's gray clay and we're talking about, you know, the gray ash. But let's see how things fared. If you look at all the pots that everybody made, only the one in the upper corner um, did not make it very well. This is excellent. And this is why very early the Lenape traded beaver and pelts for trade kettles. This was a long process and a lot of the pots did not make it. And now I can show you, um, it now is Dr. Bill Schindler, 
um, but as part of everything that he did for his doctoral thesis, he created uh, a Unami style um, Lenape red clay pot. And you see, he did not fare as well. And this was very typical. This is one of my demonstrations. The rocks around the main, main fire or where the bread usually is. But I did sh point out that the pot that Dr. Schindler made was a Unami pot. These are Muncie pots. And what I mean by that is the, in Lenape Hokin, it's made up of many different groups, even with different uh, dialects. It's not one sing single Lenape language. And above, north of the Raritan uh, River in archeological digs, you find more remnants of pots that are the style that you see here, more like Iroquois pots with necks. And the style that Dr. Schindler made is more, more fragments of that type are found for the Muncie area, which is south of the Raritan River. Now you're looking at something, hopefully you can see it, it's the beaver dam. The beaver was very, very important to the Lenape. And there was a balance of the Lenape only taking animals that they needed for a purpose and using all parts of that animal. But the balance became unheeded when Europeans entered the scene and very much wanted to trade trade kettles, uh, trade wool, uh, guns, many things that metal that the Lenape wanted for beaver pelts. Beaver pelts were held in very high esteem for the rage of beaver felt hats in Europe. So by the time of New Sweden, uh, there were very few beaver pelts that were available to be traded. Uh, it, it, it just about wiped out all of the beaver in the area in and around Philadelphia and in the county where I live. However, the beaver tail is a high status food. It was prized and now you are looking at the cross section of a beaver tail. I can honestly tell you it is not my favorite. You can see the amount of fat and gristle, but that was something that was desired. The texture is very gristly, but there's a lot of flavor. The beaver tail is on my drying rack. And just to put it in perspective, what you're looking at below is a turkey being roasted, just so that you know what that is. This shows a Unami pot in the forefront, and then what I've been referring to as trade kettles that are hanging. So they have been trading with the Europeans. And you're looking at a roasting stick. You're going to see several pictures that include roasting sticks. It's hard to tell the rabbits from the squirrels. But rabbits and squirrels were hunted frequently by those young men that were learning to hunt and kill animals in a humane way. And the furs were very much needed. The uh, rabbit skin was the diaper for the infants. And we'll talk more about that in uh, another slide. As, as rabbits and squirrels came into the village, they were roasted, they were skinned first and then roasted immediately and were eaten right away. The Lenape were not eating meals together. Now this is myself again, but I look totally different than what you have seen before because now I am interpreting post-European contact and wearing the trade goods. Instead of my brain tan wrap skirt, I am wearing a wool. It is still wrapped and it always made me feel extremely wide because the fabric would not be cut. 
So I would be taking the fabric that would go up high to my chest and folding it down. Uh, I also have the trade silk. If you look at the bottom of my wrap skirt and I am wearing the, the most prized color wool or the most frequently requested, which was the blue. I am also wearing what the elder women would be requesting for trading for shirts was the off-white uh, ruffled man's shirt. And if you notice my ties around my leggings and I'm still wearing my brain tan leggings, it is finger woven wool instead of finger woven um, um, cordage. And what I am doing, I have a gourd in my hand and I'm putting bear grease on the venison roast. So the hunters have just come in. Everyone has been busy getting the hides ready but they've also been getting uh, very busy cutting the strips of meat to be dried on the drying rack. And they're gonna roast immediately and share the meat with all that are there. And here is the roasting of the turkey. Note is not anything like our butter balls. Wild turkeys fly. Um, and the difference in roasting is we, Europeans will turn the spit and the Lenape turn the turkey around it. So it's tied on, as you can see, all the feathers have been plucked and are used, wings used to fan the fire. My personal fan is um, of turkey feathers. Everything was used. Again, turkeys would only be roasted when the hunt comes in and only some of them will be roasted and they'll be shared with the village. Most of the meat would be cut into small strips and dried very quickly on the drying rack. Now, I, I will point out that there, uh, you can see some squash and pumpkins and just some artichokes that we will be talking about later on my mat. This shows roasting sticks. There are two of them here, the trade kettles and the trading for the metal S hooks as well. Note the V shape. Uh, this is what is supporting my, um, what we would call a lug pole. And here's a close up of how squirrels and rabbits were roasted. Now I'm turning to fish and we're again at the Wampanoag village at Plymouth Patuxet. Uh, this is a large bass. This is like taking two drying racks as I view it and you tie them together. You put the fish in between. You support the ends on those Y supports that go into the ground. And when the fish needs to be turned, it takes two people to turn it to the other side. And this is a closer view. You can see how it's tied in as well with cordage. Now I'm using a very small fish here. Can you see the outline? It's kind of hard in the ashes. Uh, this fish is being cooked, roasted in clay with covered with embers. You do not have to scale the fish, you just covered it with clay. And when it's done, it just all cracks apart. And as I separate it, the scales come off with the clay. And here it is. And that is another way of, of cooking fish. Returning to the Wampanoag at Plymouth Patuxet, they have a large fish that is in clay. You can see how they're managing the embers and that's also how they will turn it. And that will have the same effect when they take the clay off, the skin comes off uh, for it to be eaten. 
You can see I'm in my um, post-European contact um, trade shirt, and I am working with Schwanamic. The Schwanamic is the shad. And the Lenape would take their fishing nets and the women their knives and take their dugout canoes and go to the best fishing spots to set up their weirs. And it, being a matrilineal society, the women were in charge, you know, telling the men how many to bring, how many of the shad to bring in. There would be drawing rack after drawing rack on the shores of the Delaware River as they are drying the fish. So I am scaling a shad right now, a schwanomic, and I'll show you what the next step is. Most of my uh, demonstrations, well, all of my demonstrations really are a day long at best. And I need to dry the shad as quickly as possible. So even though most of the shad were dried whole. The female shad, the roe would be dried separately. But on days that were not sunny in order to get them dried quickly, this is the, the procedure that was used. What you see going through the shad is a needle that is made from the rib bone of a deer and it is cordage that I'm putting through. All the Y-shaped many bones of the shad are still in there. That is the calcium source for the Lenape. There were no animals that were providing milk. Uh, they were eating bone. Now, the bone is very dangerous, but after the fish is dried and reconstitute, reconstituted, it, it is so soft that it's not a problem whatsoever. But what I'm doing is stringing, as you see here, that's an, all the shad is in pieces with the skin on, it's on cordage, my drying rack is in back of me, and I will be tying that on the drying rack. And usually in a program, when I have sun, it will be completely dry. Remember again, the only method of food preservation is drying. The dried food would be stored in food storage pits, which archeologists have found were to be about six foot deep. And we also know from archeology span that things happened with food storage pits because they were in several different locations or moved in a village. These are oysters. And on the Delaware River, there are still today many of these oyster shell middens. The salt line came much farther up the Delaware River and shellfish were found. What you don't find in the middens is any evidence of the oyster shells having been opened with any implement, nor is there found to be any interpretation of a tool that was used for opening them. Because the trick is, as you see these oyster shells just on a few embers, you don't want to cook them if you want to dry them and store them. You just put them on the embers until actually the oyster is not living and the shells just come apart. You continue to cook them this way if you're going to eat them. We're into the foods that you forage for, and I've just picked a few. This one is very much uh, Lenape Hokan. What you're looking at is beach plums. They are found on the New Jersey shore. And if you're looking for them, look for them in August. And not the first vegetation, but shortly after that, from the sand, you will find these wild beach plums and they were harvested and dried in baskets on the food um, drying rack. Also the nuts, and they're falling right now. There were hickory nuts, black walnuts, and the way they were processed many times, and you can find them on trails in Lenape Hokan, 
is you find where they process, process them in the natural rock that's right there on the trails. But they are ground. The liquid you see is what is referred to by Europeans as nut milk that was used by the Lenape as well. And now we're looking at something that has the name today as a Jerusalem artichoke, which makes no sense whatsoever. And it was the English that took a Spanish word and changed it into Jerusalem. And somebody thought it tasted like artichokes. I think the better name is to refer to it as a sun choke. It is an indigenous plant to uh, Lenape Hoking and it is related to the sunflower. My chokes look just about like that. The flowers are just beginning to um, fade. I wait to harvest the choke until more energy has been put into the tuber and they are very fat. So this is a late fall, early spring harvest and this is what they look like. Before there were corn, which is actually CMAs, um, the seeds up here in Lenape Hokan, they were making bread and they were making flour. These sun chokes were one of the sources of flour. You take these chokes and dry them and then pound out the starch. Much more time consuming than corn pounding into flour, but it was done. And as I said, it's late fall as the plants put all this energy and the tubers are nice and fat as you see here. And then early spring before the plant starts to grow. I always have to talk about the cattail. As I look at this cattail stand, I don't know what you think of in your mind, but I think Lenape infant diapers and fire tinder when I look at this. This is cattail fluff. In that rabbit skin that was used for a diaper, what they changed was the cattail fluff. And when they get that spark by using the bow of the wood to create the friction, friction for fire, they are using cattail fluff. The Europeans never adopted any of the food sources from the cattail, but the cattail stand is like a grocery store for the Lenape. And since it's not known very well, I'm going to share this information uh, with you. When the cattail stand looks as you saw it in the spring, it's beginning to develop small shoots. And these are harvested by the women in the dugout canoes, just as you saw in my beginning slide, and they are eaten. As the shoots get taller and it's harder to see them, there's an, they're harvesting the greens, but they're also harvesting the white areas. But let's look at the tubers so that you can see them, how they grow underneath. There's a lot of little tiny roots, but they are very similar to the Jerusalem artichoke or sun choke in that they too are get fatter in the late fall and early spring. And you cut off all of those little minor roots and you dry them and you pound them into flour as well. Here I am. I'm not in a canoe, um, it's, it's harder to find edible cattails because cattails are typically beside roadways and have all that pollution, but I'm harvesting them as I would have from a canoe, bending over and pulling them out before the flower starts to emerge. And this white part that you see of the towards that I'm cutting with my stone knife, that was prized and they were harvested and eaten. You can eat them raw. And this is something that I have shared with children and I have not met a child who didn't like it. 
I like it raw. I'm not as fond of it when it is cooked, but both were done. What you do as you pull it up, you just take the outer coating off and then the white part is edible. These are harvested until the uh, flower start, stem starts to emerge. And there they are on my mat. And there's in the trade kettle, some boiled. That was the other way that they were eaten. As the flower head starts, this part is eaten as well. The, the flower of the cattail has a male and female part on the same stem. And the, the part that you, you eat it, that's in my trade kettle, you eat it like you'd eat corn of the cob, but you'd end up with a cob that's about the size of a knitting needle, if that makes sense. But those were eaten as well. And then there's the cattail pollen. Now you can see, even though I've got some new shoots and the pollen has emerged, this is usually about June. Um, I still have cattail fluff in the stands. I would be in a dugout canoe. I need a large gourd because the cattail pollen is like talcum powder and it will just blow in the wind. Cattail pollen was added to their basic bread which I will be describing uh, during cattail uh, season. They did try to dry some, but it doesn't have the keeping qualities of some of the other foods. Those people who study or use pollen will probably know it's very high in nutrients. And I'd love to see a nutritional analysis of cattail pollen. I do know that I am one person and all the women work together. And for me to get enough cattail pollen took a long time. And there you can see it. So now look at all the cattail stands in June and look for cattail pollen. It's really a beautiful sight. Susan, we just did have one question about the cattail flowers. Are yeah. they edible? Are the flowers edible? The cattail itself is the brown head that we know it. They didn't eat those. But what you saw in my trade kettle was the immature cattail head, and that's when they did eat them. They eat or preserve pawpaws was another question before you. I have no European documentation in regard to pawpaws. I only interpret what I have found that, have, that a European has written about. I will be talking about the Moravians who did a lot of writing and I'm hoping more and more will be translated and more information will come forth. Is there any other questions right now? Nope, there's nothing. She just says, thanks for the answers. All right. I'm showing right now, you know, I've been talking about, you know, the, um, the sun choke and drying it and pounding out the flour. And this is the cattail root dried and you're pounding out the flour. A very tedious time um, with not as great results as what the corn seeds allowed. In regards to the garden, many of you probably have heard of the three sisters, the corn, the beans, and the squash. I just want to look at this land, Mother Earth, that has been prepared for the planting. And what would happen is a dibble stick would be used at the top of the mound and three or four seeds of flower corn would be planted. Then in the four directions, about halfway down the mound, you plant the beans. I grow four different varieties of Lenape seed and they're all pole beans. The Lenape corn itself, I have two of the original seed and they're very spindly. They're not strong stalks like 
what we see in the fields and the field corn, they need the support of the beans winding around them, holding them together. And that at the base of the mound, as you see, that is where the squash is planted and with its large leaves helps to hold the moisture in the soil and it also prevents weeds. So that's how the three sisters work together in the garden. On my mats, I am wearing, let me point this out, my woven rabbit jacket. Um, that is the lighter. My, my winter coat is to deer hide with the fur. But I am working with the squash, the green and white squash, which is one of the original seeds that William Ways Weaver um, has available that I grow. And those are hollowed out and rings and they're dried as rings. And that is what I am making right now is the rings to be dried. In the elm bark basket that is next to the squash by my moccasins, those are beans. They just dry directly on the plant. Nothing else needs to be done. And then the Puam coin that is in back of that, we'll see a, a better picture of that, um, that dries on the stalks. And then the best is saved for seed. When you eat corn, beans, and squash together, they are synergistic and that you have all the nutrients that you need to sustain life. Uh, corn and beans eaten together, just like rice and beans eaten together, they're complementary proteins. There's eight amino acids that adult humans cannot produce, but those two plants provide all of them when eaten together. These are the two uh, Lenape corn that I grow. My Puham corn grows to be eight or nine feet tall. I've just finished harvesting them today. I know by European documentation that they were eight row at time of contact. And so I only save for seed, those that are eight row. My seed comes from Nora Thompson Dean of Oklahoma. She was considered the last Lenape speaker and her family kept growing both the Puham and the blue uh, corn, and I have continued to grow them. Now we're gonna go through the nixtamalization process and all of the, the flower corn that they grew, that they did not save for seed, was processed to hominy or nixtamo with this process. Corn originates in Mexico and before corn was traded to what is now the continental United States, the nixtamo process came with it. What you're looking at in my trade kettle, it looks very dark. That is because I've been adding sifted ash and I keep adding it and stirring it and waiting until a kernel of my Puham corn turns an orangey red. I was trying to get a picture of it turning orangey red, but you can't capture it too much because it sinks below the surface. But now it did turn orangey red and now, excuse me, now I am adding the rest of the Puham corn I will add as much corn as that solution will hold. Nowhere though in any of the written record I have, does it tell me how long the corn should stay in the solution before it needs to be processed with the hominy basket. You are now looking at an original Delaware hominy basket. And now you're looking at mine. Unfortunately, at the sites where I interpret, even though there are waterways in back of me, they will not allow me to walk into the waterways. And so what I'm using is a huge tub. And so the water would not be so dark. 
So use your imagination. Uh, one thing you may know that ash added to water will create lye. Lye will take your skin off. Lye was also known by the Europeans because they used it for soap making and saponification. But it's, it is dangerous. So one Lenape woman would be carrying the hominy basket to the waterways and one the lied corn standing in the water so the water is running away from them. And when you pour the corn into the basket, it stays in the basket and the hulls start rising to the top. So now I'm pouring it into the basket the water, see, it wouldn't be that dark. I'm going up and down and it's hard to see any hulls coming to the top because I have nowhere for the lie to go, but the lie would be going downstream. But now you can see the, this is the poem coin that has been processed with the lie. Now what that does, the nixtamal process, it takes off the hull and the hull is something that the human body does not break down very well. And if you think about yourself and when you eat sweet corn, you probably have noticed that uh, you didn't digest it all. You, you can see it, the whole corn. And that's not gonna be very useful when you need the nutrients and the calories from, from that, when it's a major part of your diet. Also, you, it will prevent you from getting the niacin from the corn and then you get pellagra. And so the next mile process was done to remove the hulls. It is also very practical because when you're grinding corn, having the hulls not there makes it easier to grind. And when you're reconstituting all dried food with water, it reconstitutes faster. Now you can see the complete difference. And my Elmbach basket is the Puham coin kernels and in the how many basket is the same kernels processed with lye. But the ones on the left are wet and they would spoil. So what happens next is they have to be laid out on a mat or in baskets on the drying rack until they're dried and then they would be stored in the food storage pit. Now, this I, I hope you can kind of see some of these um, hulls some of them are short, they're very, very thin. And when the hominy basket comes out, not 100% of the, the hulls have actually floated to the top and into the water. It was considered an honor for children to be rubbing off the, the last of these hulls. So this is the nixtamalization process. Now, I am very grateful and thankful to this Moravian missionary, John Heckewalder, because John Heckewalder was so interested in Lenape food waves that he wrote the specifics about the Lenape bread that I've been able to follow. And he even gave some specifics for what he called their, an excellent pottage that they made. Now, prior to my reading John Heckewalder's work and finding that, I was making my cornbread too small. I was grinding it, but what I didn't know that it had to be sifted and made even finer. And I was making the bread as large as I could with what I had, but when you make it finer and add water and and need it as the word that was translated from his work, I, I could make it the dimensions that he described because he actually described that it was about six inches in diameter and one inch thick. He also described additives that were added to their bread. In the front bread, that is venison. It is the dried venison pounded, and you'll see a picture of that added to it. And in the back one, uh, that is hickory nuts that are added to it. And note on the rock, there's one in a green leaf, and we'll just describe that next. Now, we talked about the bread uh, being baked 
in the main fire on what he called clean ash and also uh, baked is partly sun and partly the heat of the rock on the rock as well. Now, this is what that green packet was. This is green corn bread. Now, green corn is what we eat in sweet corn. Did you know sweet corn is the genetic mutation of corn that the Lenape knew about but had no purpose for them because the carbohydrate in it was simple and sugar. And when the corn got to maturity, it was just like corn candy. They needed flour. But all corn goes through the green stage. And it is when the hus are green, when they give thanks for the corn and have the green corn ceremonies. John Heckewalder describes for me the exact way to fold the leaves of the corn to put the mashed green corn. And all that is, is just the corn that's mashed in my wet corn pounder. And it too, just like sweet corn, when you put your thumbnail in it, squirts back at you. But instead of being clear liquid and sweet, it's milky and starchy. So this is green corn bread. This is what the venison or turkey looks like when you get it ready to use. This is how it pounds very easily in a rock, no effort whatsoever. And this is how it was added to the bread. But now I am showing you the documentation for what John Heckewilder called an excellent pottage. Now, as I described this bread and, and pottage, this is the daily fare of the Lanape in the village every day. There are so many different options, the tastes do change. All the food is rehydrated in large pots. All the food is available at every hour of the day. Anytime a, a visitor guest came through, a traveler, a, um, a trader, they would be taken to the main fire and given bread and offered some of the pottage. So you have to think of pots that are reconstituting the foods because you know how dried beans and it takes so long and pots always ready. But this is just one of the pottage. Those that lived in the village did not all eat at the same time. By European um, account, they went to the main fire when they were hungry and they ate the bread and the pottage. And on average, that was twice a day. So that's what we know about food eaten. These are all the ingredients that John Heckewalder indicated in what he referred to as an excellent pottage. So you see the dried venison. If we go clockwise, next is the Puham hominy. The beans are my Shakamaxon, and the Shakamaxon of uh, the group that lived in what is Fishkill now near uh, Philadelphia. You can see the green and white squash rings. And now I think you can notice better that squash is very, very high in water. So when they're dried, you see very little of what we would call the flesh and see more of the rind, which we don't eat at all. All of that was just reconstituted and then chestnuts. So those are the ingredients. And now you can see the pottage. So daily fare was pottage and bread. This is my last slide, but I am going to um, put on the slide of with information of where to find me. I do have a website that's in badly need of updating. Uh, my blog, I post every other day. Uh, my Facebook post right now, I have a Lenape post on it. I have a picture on the left. That was my interpretation uh, just this past weekend on, I think that was October 9th. And I think I'm standing looking very proud at my granddaughter who's playing uh, the, the native flute. If you look on the mat, I have a suitcase that shows an entire Lenape village in Cohenhouse dolls for interpretation. And that's what my granddaughter is interpreting. And then I have two email if anyone has any questions. And with that, I thank you for your attention, Wanishi. 
and I will find out if there are any other questions. Thank you, Susan. That was great. I always enjoy your uh, programs. Um, it was very informative. I don't think we have one question about, you had said you got some seeds from William Woy's Weaver. Does yeah. he offer them to the public or is that just through the food waste group? Oh, yes. Uh, he, oh, I'm trying to think. It's rough wood. It's not his name. It's uh, ha, email me and I'll give you the name. Because what William Ways Weaver is doing now, because he's looking to the future, and he is he has somebody who's growing out these seeds, and he has more seed available, and it's on a website. I know the first word is rough wood, but it's not coming to me. So if you email me, I can provide you with that name. So yes, you can get quite a number of them. He's not just doing Lenape seats, but he does have the Puem coin. He does, I'm not sure how much of the green and white squash he has. Um, my beans I've gotten from various other sources. I, I would just note that um, William Moyes Weaver is a food historian and has several books. We have several in our store, in fact, yes. available. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he so, has a um, wonderful garden at his home, but he yeah. realizes that he needs to keep his seeds going beyond his time. And he has, he has succeeded in making um, it available. Okay, so we have some questions starting to come in. This is great. Was there a lot of sickness due to improperly cured meat? There is none documented whatsoever, but have, being a registered dietitian and how the meat comes in and how it is dried is one of the safest practices there is. Once a food is completely dry and no moisture, bacteria cannot grow. Um, and I had the privilege of being down um, in Virginia and I was with the Powhatan when the state police called them because they had a bear that was killed, just killed, and they wanted to know if they wanted it in their village. What I watched was a village really working together. That bear came in and they had it skinned and they had the meat on the roast and they had all the strips on in record time. So yes, the, the food was safe. Uh, we have another question here. I heard that the Lenape would not eat rabbits because they believed in a spirit that was a rabbit. Is that true? That's not what the documentation said. Um, they believe that there is a spirit in all living things, all plants and all animals. They ate animals that ate vegetables, if you notice. Uh, they were basically vegetarian, the animals that they used. And they were only to take the animals that they need. And I did mention that with the beaver that 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 kind of philosophy changed, but there was a spirit in all animals and all plants and living things, and they gave thanks and they used all parts. And the rabbit is definitively the diaper and they were roasting rabbits on sticks. What did they drink? What did the Lenape drink, Susan? Water. Now, it's hard to say, you know, there was so many, they had better medicine than the Europeans. And it was all herbal medicine, you know, and it's hard to say when the shaman puts something in the water, you know, how much, so many, how much sumac berries did they, you know, use in their water or was it just for medicinal purposes? Uh, corn silk tea, is um, a medicine that was used for urinary tract in intestines. But basically from what I've read, water. Okay. And let me tell you this story, I didn't say it. Go ahead. Well, I didn't say a couple of things about the corn. When, when I cook with all of these different indigenous corns that I grow, 
the aroma and flavor is phenomenal. Um, they're all different, just like heirloom corn and apples. Mm -hmm. And I said the six inch bread, one inch thick, it's very fine. And when I take a bite of it, it takes every bit of saliva out of my mouth and my mouth is totally dry. So I am convinced they ate it with the pottage because I don't know how else they, they could eat it. I've never had an experience like that when I did that the first time. Interesting. But I think, I think one of the things that, that, that is important to note that the connectedness with the land, the connectedness with their surroundings, you know, uh, foraging, uh, things they were growing, uh, what they were catching, if you will. Um, and, and that's something that many of us don't have today. Um, we don't have a connectedness with the land. A lot of, lot of people move from place to place to place. They don't, they don't feel a deep connection with the land that they're on because it's just a house and it might just be temporary. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something that um, really sticks out that we need to appreciate that connectedness and learn that connectedness again, because once the land is gone, so is our food supply. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions and we thank everybody for joining us tonight. And we will be taking a couple of months off here because we have our in-person events going on at the Cloister in November and December. So we look forward to seeing you all again in the new year and uh, do keep in touch with us through uh, Facebook and our website to learn of our upcoming events. Thank you all very much.